Our journey started in Sorrento, Victoria, and it ends here in Hobart, Tasmania, just as it did for old William Buckley all those years ago. We've got a huge episode today. We're going to check out another great craft brewery, and we're going to have a look around this beautiful city of Hobart. I'm Matt Stewart, and this is The Beer Pioneer. He's out there, somewhere, crossing country, north to south, east to west, following rainbows for the liquid pot of gold. The man is amber obsessed. He's conquering fears, drinking boutique beers, just for you and me. He's a man on a mission, a liquid dietitian, a bearded brewery magician. I oh, is the beer pioneer. He is the beer pioneer. He's the beer pioneer. He's the admiral of cheer. He's the admiral of cheer. He is the amber cavalier. Musketeer. He's a molten musketeer. He is the baby buccaneer. He's a baby buccaneer. Oh yes, he is the beer pioneer. Oh yes, he is. In 1835, William Buckley emerged from the bush more than three decades after escaping the Collins convict settlement. The Europeans he approached at a camp were astonished he had survived. Later that year, he was pardoned, and after a stint working as an intermediary between the colonies and the Wuthering people, he packed up and sought retirement across the Bass Strait in Tasmania. A little later on, I'm going to visit the final resting place of William Buckley, but first I'm heading to Hobart's historic waterfront district home to Hobart Brewing Co. This is my last brewery for the season and it's looking like a great spot to finish. In 2013, founder Brendan Parnell wanted to open up his brewery on Hobart's waterfront and headhunted Scott for the top job. We met over beers as you do. Yeah. And uh, he told me his idea. Um, I tried talking him out of it <laughs> and I failed at that. And yeah, it went from there. So I love how you were able to get Hobart Brewing. It's still available. Uh, yeah, you know, we, we actually spent a lot of time thinking about that because it, it seemed a, a bit too obvious mm -hmm. and we were wondering why um, nobody else had picked it up. But yeah, we, we grabbed it. I have noticed, Scott, that you don't sound like you're from around here. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what's your backstory? Well, I'm married to uh, an Australian. She grew up in Melbourne. And we both... Ah, you say it like an Australian. Yeah, well, we, we've been <laughs> together long enough that, uh, yeah, we uh, first came to Tassie together nearly 20 years ago. And uh, it actually reminds me of where I grew up in, in upstate New York. And, and so I fell in love with Tassie right away. I felt comfortable here. And, it's an amazing place. Yeah, there, there's a rawness and a wildness here. And uh, it's missing you know, over 350 million Americans. So that, that was a bit <laughs> desirable as well. And um, what, what's the beer culture like over there? Cause you, the, yeah. you didn't start brewing at Moo Brew. You were brewing in America first. That's right. Yeah, I, I got my start uh, at a Colorado brewery called Oster Blues. Scott's got some good advice for anyone wanting to be a brewer. Basically just start brewing some beer and get yourself out there. I'd always wanted to become a brewer. I, I'm an old school guy who spent a long time home brewing. I walked around to eight different breweries one day and I got seven rejections. And Oscar Blues said, see you tomorrow morning at eight wow. o'clock. And uh, so I started on their canning line, which was um, at the time, Craft Beer's first ever canning line. Wow, in yeah. the world. Yeah. Yep. Bloody hell, that's yeah. cool. So since I've been interested in craft beer for the last however many years. People always say oh, America's always about 10, 10 or so years ahead. Do you, you think it's still like that? No, I don't. When Kate and I first arrived in Tassie, there were maybe 100 breweries in Australia and like seven or eight in Tassie. And now I think that number is uh, somewhere between seven to 800. And Tassie has over 30 breweries and the quality um, of the beer being brewed in Australia has has risen. 
with some really big players like Stone and Wood and and you know Balter, Four Pines, all the Pirate Life, Mountain Goat, and and certainly here Mubru here in Tassie, they were kind of founded on that principle of quality and consistency, and I think lifting everybody's game and no, you know nobody's being left behind. On the last trip back to Colorado and California, you know, we were a bit underwhelmed. Wow. And it wasn't that anything had dipped down there, it's just that everything here has just been getting better and better every year. And, and so I, I think, you know, the beer being brewed around Australia is on par with anywhere in the world. Wow. Well, that's as good of a segue as any for me to start drinking. Let's meet Alex at the bar and relish the chemistry I strike up so effortlessly. Alex, you're the second in charge here. Oh, you're second in charge, right? Okay. I've yeah. already, I've already <laughs> spoken to the big guy, and he's, it feels like he's sent me down one peg to you. Oh. But now second in charge is a big, big gig. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, started here in the bar and then worked my way up through into the brew house. Can we um, explain to the viewers that I'm not real short or you're not real tall. You're just standing, for some reason, it's not, to me it feels like an ego thing from bartenders. <laughs> we need to stand above you. Is that kind of what's going on here? Yeah, look, I'm not gonna, not gonna change your words, mate, but. <laughs> uh, and to really peek behind the curtain um, to the viewers, we did toy with the idea of me standing on a box. <laughs> and that's more about my ego, but apparently this looks too ridiculous, so. I promise I won't let this small man complex affect my interviewing performance. What drew you to the beer industry? I studied at uni chemistry and science and then sort of followed that for a bit and then decided that wasn't really my thing. So I just came back and worked working in bars, drinking beers that I loved and then was lucky enough to grab a job here and kind of get my way into the brewing industry. Do you think the science background helps because I reckon I've talked to a bunch of people who either have an engineer or a science background who end up in brewing. Mm, absolutely yeah like science is such an important part of brewing and understanding the processes and I guess trying to make the best beer that you can. But then there's also the science and then the creativity. Science and art blended as one. That's a beautiful matching of two worlds. It really is <laughs> and that's being able to explore that creative element and bring the science as such a critical part. While we chat, would you mind if we um, try a few of these? Absolutely, Matt. Not to be bloody. <laughs> nice one, Matt. So I think we'll start with our Harbour Master, one of the first beers that we brewed. Yeah, I think you mentioned this one maybe even started its life being brewed out of the Mubru Brewery. Yeah, and I think before that as a home brew. Oh, wow. In, it's one of his... in the 90s, in the States. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. So this is kind of our flagship beer, I guess. We call it a Tasmanian Ale, uh, brewed with hops grown just up the road in Bushy Park. Yeah, kind of a nice copper colour. Yeah. Brewed as a home brew, but then thought about what would a beer that was brewed in the early days of the brewing history in Tasmania, what would that be like? Right, it does have a, like a kind of an old Englishy kind of mm. style flavour to it or something. Yeah, exactly. Just that really biscuity malt character, little bit of hop. But yeah. Yeah, you can, I can picture a convict drinking this. Okay, well, <laughs> maybe we should steer clear of the whole convict <laughs> reference here. I don't want to be a part of that. <laughs> oh, come on. Is it, are we still sensitive down here about convict stuff? <laughs> This, show, uh, this whole show's following a convict around. I can't, I've got no problem with, you got a problem with convicts? <laughs> no, Everyone I don't. deserves a second chance, Alex. Colonialism, I don't. maybe. Oh, okay, yeah, <laughs> right, <laughs> all right. Uh, none of this is being used, <laughs> but anyway. This is allowed. The, the, uh, I don't want to be calling you out as a colonialist. Well, I mean, uh, the, I wasn't, be, was I being pro-colonialist by <laughs> uh, saying no. a convict might drink this? <laughs> Speaking of convicts, coming up after the break, we visit William Buckley's final resting place. I've got small man syndrome, yeah. <laughs> Little chip on the shoulder for sure. And it set in real quick. <laughs> Obviously, we don't have any footage of William Buckley's final leg, but luckily my film crew are documenting every step of my own. Did they overshoot the scene? Almost definitely. But after they insisted I'd do this walk again and again, and again and again and again, I insisted that they use every inch of the footage. Look at me go. 
This small park near Battery Point is his final resting place, so I'm hoping it provides a fitting spot to reflect upon all the ground both him and now myself have covered. William Buckley had fled the convict settlement in present day Victoria in 1803 and he lived for 32 years on the coast of southern Victoria with a local Aboriginal tribe of the Wathaurong people. As this plaque describes, this incredible story is commonly believed to be the source of the phrase, you've got Buckley's chance, which means you have almost no chance. You got bloody Buckley's mate. Eventually Buckley gave himself up to the authorities. He was pardoned and in 1837 moved to Hobart. Buckley spent his latter years living in Battery Point and after his death in 1856 was buried in the St George's Burial Ground, located at the rear of this small reserve. Now I'm going to take a few moments to just soak in this peaceful ambiance of Buckley's final resting place here in Hobart. I can't help but wonder if this final resting place does justice to the man and his epic life. But if, like me, he finds the hum of four lanes of passing traffic relaxing, I reckon he'd like it here just fine. Back at Hobart Brewing, Alex has given me a look around this awesome venue. Alex, where are we? <laughs> here in the brewery now. Yeah, all right. Do you mind showing us around? Yeah, yeah. Let's have a look. Fuck, that felt awful. That was, can we do that so again? Good. Yeah, this feels, that was fucked. This feels so was gross. Like... So, is there anything in, in your brewery that sets it apart from others? Uh, I guess we're really lucky to have a brewery that's so directly correlated with the bar. And yeah, it's right there. So I imagine people coming in would enjoy that, just to be like, you know, it doesn't get much fresher. There's big breweries <laughs> who talk about brewery fresh. Yeah, exactly. But they got nothing on this. Absolutely. And then it opens up, like it's an amazingly um, sort of uh, spread out venue. So, if, I mean, I can see there's a taco truck and other food vans around, so people come out and it's sort of kind of, it feels like it'd be a mini festival. Yeah, almost. it's a really nice atmosphere in the sunshine and summer. Yeah. It's beautiful. Are you open at the moment? No, <laughs> I was gonna just say, for you. Yeah, <laughs> bloody hell, absolute VIP treatment. So over here, you're like in the shadow of the IXL Jam Empire. Yeah, so okay. this whole district, it's, well, it's on reclaimed land, so this all used to be in the water. And oh, right. this is where the famous IXL Jams were made. I didn't realise it was like a, 100 years or a Hobart thing. Yep. The actual building you're in, the, the red part of the shed, that's a heritage listed structure, is that right? Yeah, so it's something, something like 100 years old. It's been in this this space a couple of times and it was transported, broken down and then oh, right. rebuilt elsewhere. Yeah, right. And brought back. That's cool. So, I yeah, mean, this is sort of, you know, where the the magic happens, so yeah, to speak. This is, uh, this is our sort of stage space, I guess. You get, you do get, you get bands in and... Yep, bands, yep. Comedians. Sort of world-class comedians. World-class comedians, yeah, like yourself. Yeah, yeah. Playing right there. You should get yeah. up and have a practice, mate. Okay, well, I love the red curtain. It's a real classic. This is this how you know a comedian's uh, comfortable on stage? <laughs> They're leaning. <laughs> comfortable on stage and on camera. Have you got a philosophy on the kind of beers you brew here? Mm. If I lived in a German ski town, Garmisch Partenkirchen, then West Germany. The Berlin Wall was still up. Wow. Yeah, and uh, at that time I was a uh, Budweiser drinking American, and you know, all of a sudden I'm in Bavaria, you know, one of the, the heartland of beer in the world, and drinking beers I had never heard of before, and that's kind of where I had my epiphany. And so here at Hobart Brewing, I think we, we take inspiration from beers around the world, and but when we brew a beer here, we try to find some kind of Tassie connection to make it just be a part of where we're living. And so, yeah, there is, is a focus on, on our core range where hops are growing up the road in Bushy Park. You know, we're not the closest brewery to the hop fields in, in Victoria or Tassie, but we're definitely among the closest breweries there. And they're, they're hops that are used by breweries 
people around them. Oh, place. absolutely. You know, they have a couple of varieties, Galaxy being one that's one of the most sought after pops in the world. Yeah. And then our seasonals, we, we play around a little more and branch out into different styles from around the world. And uh, again, trying to find that local connection. Do you have a favorite? I'm fascinated with IPAs, India Pale Ales. One that we have on tap now is uh, called Dream Ale. One of our core beers is a cream ale, and it's a traditional American style that's brewed kind of northeast part of the country. And uh, so what we did is we took that beer, which is just when you want a beer, that's all it is. Just It's a lawnmower beer, no hop presence in it at all. It's just easy drinking. Thought, oh, what would happen if we uh, smashed it full of hops, added some oats to it, and maybe even a touch of lactose, and 4.7% uh, oat cream that drinks a bit like an IPA. Ah, uh, I'm sold. Let's try the cream ale first. It's uh, an old American style, originally brewed by European immigrants to kind of replicate European lager yep. in America. Right. Cheers. Cheers. So yeah. Yeah, it's not a style you see, cre the cream ale. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, so it's got that slightly creamy, creamy note, but really nice, crisp, smashable. This is probably the beer if someone comes in and be like, oh, just give me a lager, mate. Yeah, yeah. Then we'd probably see him towards this. Right. It's what's got called the uh, lawnmower beer. The lawnmower beer. Yeah. Which is a phrase that I've only heard inside breweries. <laughs> only, only, it feels like that's a, it's a term that brewers all know. I've never heard it said outside of a, a brewery. Outside of a brewery, no, like, well, do you mow your lawn? Yeah. Well, oh, I know. Do you drink a beer while yeah, well, doing it? Honestly, it's changed my whole world. I didn't know that was an option. <laughs> you can actually buy a stubby holders to go on the handle of your lawnmower. That's the next step. That is the next step, mate. <laughs> this beer uses uh, Cascade, which is a variety that's grown up at Bushy Park. You've got, so you've got these hops sitting here. Are they, uh, are they out for a reason? Like it's for, just so people can see this is what it. Yeah, so that's what fresh uh, hop flowers look they like. Don't, they don't really have a massive, or maybe not, not by this stage. Don't yeah, so they've only been out since yesterday. Because uh, we chucked some more hops in the fermenter yesterday. Yeah. And they've already probably oxidized and lost a lot of their aroma, right. which is another challenge when you're uh, brewing with fresh hops. You have to use them pretty much straight away. Right, so it's, you get the call, hops are ready, you, yeah. you're going down, it's like 3 a.m. or something. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much, well, this year we got the call at the day before and said your hops are gonna be ready up at the office in, just up in North Hobart at 7.30, come and pick them up and brew that day. Right. So it would have been less than 24 hours from farm to brew. That's exciting. Yeah. All right, time for that dream ale. As I understand, I don't want to tell you about your own beers, but as I understand it, this is the cream ale sort of just turned up a bit with some lactose, uh, a lot of hops. Yep, yep, absolutely. So we... I mean, it's really changed, I mean, it's changed the flavor significantly, as you probably would assume. Yeah, absolutely. So this really emphasizing that creamy character by the addition of oats and lactose. So it really kind of fooling out the body and give it a nice creamy mouthfeel. Yeah, so we make that by literally making it an OT cream ale because we add oats and a big addition of hops to our cream ale. Yeah, it's lovely. And this kind of style of beer we always have on tap here to give dedicated craft beer and small brewery Let's be drinkers. Honest, nerds. <laughs> beer nerds, yeah, <laughs> we call it that. Something different every time they come in. Oh, this is nice. I mean, spending time with you. <laughs> and you, mate. And lastly, a personal favourite style of mine, the porter. The second beer that we release is Hobart Brewing Co. Right. Um, oh, look at that. Delicious. Oh. Cheers, mate. Cheers. Uh, so it's really nice, roasty, rich, kind of spicy flavours from the rye. Mmm. Is that uh, traditionally 
been a higher percentage of, of dark beer drinkers in Tassie to compare to the mainland. Climate plays, plays yeah. a part of it as well. Like it always lends itself well drinking a pint of stout in a warm pub. Yeah, on a, open fire. Yeah, on yeah. a cold winter's day. Oh, well, that's what dreams are made of. Yeah, well, there's eight months of it every year in Hobart, so come on down. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much for taking me through the range, Alex. It has been a pleasure, um, and I'm looking forward to crashing on your couch someday <laughs> soon. Thanks for coming down. Cheers. Cheers. Well, that marks the last beer for me this season, so I'm heading up to nearby Mount Wellington or Kunanyi for some stunning views and my last outro. We're overlooking beautiful Hobart as we bring to a close season one of The Beer Pioneer. <laughs> so many great memories. Not personally, it's all a bit hazy for me, but luckily the cameras were rolling and I'll probably look over those tapes soon to refresh the memory. That's by the by, not really any of your concern. I really just want to tell you thanks for tuning in and maybe we'll see you next season. If you have missed some of the earlier episodes or just want to follow along with our journey, please check out the links below. Anyway, I've been Matt Stewart and this has been The Beer Pioneer. Catch you next time. Yeah, so a lot of self-loathing setting in <laughs> mid-take, is that? <clears throat> 200! We're on board the Polpero, one of the oldest charter boats on Victoria's port. <laughs> Inspired a popular Australian phrase. <laughs> I've been told I'm a bit deadpan, but I've, I feel like I'm the most animated person in the world when talking to you. That's good. Um, mm, and you bring the back of the head into um, into the resonances, and then it's almost like passion, guava, and melon guava. sort of stuff. That's what I was meaning. Damn it! <laughs> oh, guava. Should have known. Damn. You've never used butterfly pea blossom before. <laughs> well, amateur. <laughs> what is this amateur hour here at Jetty Road? Never used pea body. Lotus flower. Unbelievable. I, uh, literally never happened in the history of the mill. Oh, this feels nice. good. Am I nailing it? Mate, you're smashing it. <laughs>